Good evening. My name is Wendy Lauer. I'm the acting director of the Jack Joseph and Morton Mendel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies here at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. I am pleased to welcome you to the 2017 Joseph and Rebecca Meyerhoff Annual Lecture. Tonight we mark the lecture's 23rd anniversary at the museum and recognize one of the founders of the museum, Harvey M. Meyerhoff, and his family for their philanthropic support. Their gift has allowed us to bring the top scholars in the world to our museum to give one of the most prestigious annual lectures in the field. We have published the lectures both online and in print, and this lecture series and other printed materials about our programs and initiatives are available on tables outside the theater. The Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies organizes a multitude of programs, including this one, all with the aim of securing and expanding the research, teaching, and learning that comes with in-depth study of the Holocaust. As part of our mission to generate new knowledge about this documented history, we have undertaken major research projects and publications that require the involvement of our teams of experts. Tonight, I would like to highlight one such under undertaking, the Encyclopedia of Camps and Ghettos. It is the most comprehensive survey of the Nazi detention sites, or the Nazi de detention universe, not of 5,000 such sites, which was our initial estimate, but the more than 44,000 that we actually uncovered in European archives. When complete, the encyclopedia will appear in seven volumes. The first two were published in 2009 and are now available to you for free online. You can download and search the entries on our website. The third volume will appear in early 2018 and will mark a seismic shift in how we understand collaboration. Did you know that Germany's allies, the Hungarians, French, Romanians, Croatians, Slovakians, established and ran some 720 sites? There was a vast government-sponsored infrastructure of collaboration across Europe. Our commitment to this path-breaking research on the camps such as that it expands our foundation of knowledge, is one of the reasons that Professor Voxman is here tonight to deliver the 2017 Meyerhoff Annual Lecture. A member of the Royal Historical Society, Nicholas Voxman is a professor of modern European history at Burbeck College. He serves on the advisory boards of the memorials in Sachsenhausen, Robinsbrück, Belzen, and Mauthausen. He recently devised an educational website on the Nazi camps, supported by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Dr. Voxman is a relentless researcher and prolific author. Supported by major grants from the Guggenheim Foundation, Leverholm Trust, and British Academy, among other prestigious foundations, Voxman has authored or co-authored six works on the Nazi camps and prisons. His work, Hitler's Prisons, Legal Terror in Nazi Germany, which was published with Yale University Press in 2004, quickly established him in the field though he was known earlier, um, already in the late 90s, as a member of the scholarly team that defended Deborah Lipstadt in the libel case mounted by Holocaust denier David Irving. His support role in that landmark case was significant and even made it into the cast of characters in last year's feature film, Denial. Voxman's latest masterpiece, K.L., A History of the Nazi Concentration Camps, which has been translated into German, Dutch, Italian, French, Polish, Russian, Spanish, and Portuguese, has garnered many prestigious awards, including the Wolfson History Prize in 2016, which recognizes excellence in the writing of history for the general public. And with this prize, Voxman joins the ranks of other winners, including Ian Kershaw, Anthony Beaver, and Catherine Meridel. KL weighs in at over 700 pages in paperback that a book of such heft covering the complexity of the Nazi camp system has been published in paperback and translated into the multiple languages and was awarded this most prestigious public history prize speaks volumes about Professor Waxman's mastery of the subject matter and skill as a writer. The New York Times book reviewer Roger Cohen called it a monumental study in which Voxman makes the unimaginable palpable. Similar rave reviews and feature articles have appeared in The New Yorker, The Wall Street Journal, and Financial Times. His study is not a dry cataloging of the different camps as discrete histories of persecution sites. He explains the underlying concepts and logic that drove the system, readers discovery the machinery as a whole, and his work is driven by larger questions about terror. What are its mechanisms? What does it look like? 
What paths do leaders and societies take that lead them to a reliance on terror as a form of rule and a condition of existence in peacetime and at war? In Voxman's words, the KL system was a great transformer of values whereby violence, torture, and murder became normalized. Tonight, Professor Voxman will lecture on concentration camps, the limits of representing history. He has agreed to take questions following his lecture, and if you have a question, please come to one of the microphones that have been set up here in the aisles up front, and please identify yourself and keep your question brief so that we can accommodate as many people as possible. And following the lecture, I hope that you will all join us for a reception in the museum's Hall of Witness. And please turn off your cell phones at this moment and other noise-making electronic devices and join me in welcoming Professor Nicholas Foxman to the podium. Thank you, Wendy. That was lovely. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the extremely kind introduction. Thank you for the uh, invitation. Thank you also to the Meyerhoff family for supporting this talk, and thank you all for coming this evening. One day in 1944, deep down the abyss that was Auschwitz-Birkenau, several Jewish women who had recently been deported from Hungary discussed an essential question. If they were to survive their suffering, how could they describe it? How could they explain Auschwitz to those who had not experienced it? One of the women suggested a film uh, about an inmate's passage through the camp to the crematorium. Another one added that the audience should be forced to line up outside the cinema at night and stand to attention for hours without food, without drink, just like prisoners before roll call. That way, she said, the audience would get a real feeling for our situation. But even this, the women knew, would be in vain because viewers would never be able to feel what the prisoners had felt, safe in the knowledge that after the screening they would go safely home. Also, how could the camp, in all its cruelty, ever be captured on film? And so the women's conversation in Birkenau grew to a halt. Silence spread as they contemplated the unimaginable reality of Auschwitz, as one of them put it a few months later in a secret diary. Historians have wrestled with this question of representation ever since the liberation of Auschwitz and other concentration camps. Their effort is a necessary one. The camps stood at the heart of Nazi terror, and they embodied the obsessions of Nazi leaders like no other institution in the Third Reich. Historians can't leave the history of the camps to cranks and deniers. But historians face a complex task. There is no clear way, clear, clear, clear cut way of writing about the camps, writing about crimes that seem to defeat language and defy reason. I have tried to find a way for myself in the recent history on the Nazi concentration camps called KL. KL stood for the term the SS used at the time. Konzentrationslager was abbreviated as KL at the time. Uh, and what I want to do tonight is not so much restate what I've already done in the book, but I want to talk about writing such a project about how we approach the history of the camps as historians. I want to take you behind the scenes from the printed page, as it were, back to the empty one, um, to the documents, to the archives, to libraries, um, uh, to talk about the challenges and choices involved in writing about the Nazi concentration camps. Before I do that, I want to make three preliminary points. First, even though I will come back to uh, my own book a couple of times during this talk, I want to make clear at, at the beginning that 
this isn't some kind of heroic story of overcoming obstacles. My aim in many ways is the opposite. I want to show where the, where the limits are to what historians can achieve. Limits imposed by the sources, limits imposed by the subject matter. Uh, and I was well aware of those limits when I was working on this book, which is the reason I called it as a subtitle, A History of the Concentration Camps, because I'm well aware that the history can't be written. Secondly, I'm not suggesting uh, that this research into Nazi camps is somehow uniquely difficult. Um, some of what I'm going to say also applies to other fields of historical study. As for those things which are specific in terms of challenges posed by writing of the camps, other fields of inquiry have their own particular challenges. So this is not some kind of special pleading. Third, I'm also very well aware that I'm not the first historian to discuss this question of representation of Nazi terror and the Holocaust. Far more eminent scholars than me have been here before. Just think of the important essay collection Probing the Limits of Representation, uh, edited by uh, Sol Friedlander some 25 years ago now. Um, but whereas that book and, and many others in the field are more concerned with theoretical issues, in the case of Friedlander's edited book, The Challenges of Postmodernism, I'm going to try to talk more about practical problems facing historians. So let me start at the beginning of how such a project takes shape. And all historians at the start of a new work have to make some big decisions uh, about scope and about scale. And there were three such decisions I made, uh, and I want to briefly outline them and also outline some of the immediate drawbacks and problems that arise. First, uh, my plan and decision early on was to write a comprehensive history. That is, not a history of one camp, but of the camp system as a whole. That said, it would have been impossible in a single volume to include all camps that spread across Nazi Germany and its occupied territories. You all know that Nazi Germany was a land of camps. And thanks to our colleagues uh, here at the USHMM working on the encyclopedia of camps, we can identify several tens of thousands, as Wendy has said, camps, different sites run by very different authorities at different times with different functions. And I chose to focus on one type of camp only, and that was the SS concentration camp system uh, under the overall authority of SS leader Heinrich Himmler. That decision, <clears throat> though, immediately comes at a very heavy price. And that price is that uh, it means that other sites of terror, detention, mass murder, um, like ghettos, uh, like uh, death camps like Treblinka, which only have one function, that is to kill as many Jews as quickly as possible, those sites inevitably are pushed to the margins of the narrative. So that is one of the drawbacks. Even with a focus on concentration camps alone, it would have been impossible to cover every single camp in detail. This is a map which uh, colleagues of mine have put together uh, of many, though not all, of the main camps, the more than two dozen main camps, and the over 1,100 satellite camps which existed during the period of the Third Reich. Um, it made no sense to me when I started this project to try to write another encyclopedia um, covering every single one of those sites because that already existed. So the plan was rather to try and write a narrative um, developing uh, the system, explaining how, how it evolved and how life and death inside changed. But that approach poses the next problem, and that is that obviously one has to prioritize some camps over others. Um, so Dachau, which was the birthplace of the SS concentration camp system and very much influenced other sites, features far more prominently than camps set up only during the Second World War. And certainly some of the smaller satellite camps, which you see spread here all the way from the Baltic states um, 
to, uh, in, in the west, we can't see that here, a satellite camp on the British Channel Island of Alderney. Um, not all of these camps could be included. So my first choice was to try and write this comprehensive history of the SS concentration camp system. The second major decision was to cover the entire period of the Third Reich. So 1933, when the system first takes shape with improvised camps set up all over Germany, which have the purpose of destroying the political opposition in Germany, to 1945 and the deliberation of the last camps in April and May. But this decision raises further questions for historians, not least how do we prevent such a study from growing too big? One solution is to impose a strict chronology and to be selective about the material handle. But again, that is a problem because how do you decide what to include and what not? And one of the biggest problems thinking back to me now, thinking back now about the writing process is the very hard decision to leave out some heartbreaking stories uh, which I had read but couldn't fit into the narrative. The third major decision um, was to tell this comprehensive history from multiple perspectives. Those who planned, built, and ran the camps, those who suffered them, and those who viewed them from further away. The aim, in other words, was an integrated history, as Sol Friedlander called it, connecting, and I quote, the policies of the perpetrators, the attitudes of surrounding society, and the world of the victims. And what I want to focus on uh, in the remaining time I have is on the writing of such a integrated history. How do we go about doing this? And I'm going to not say much about the onlookers. Maybe we can leave that uh, for the questions uh, uh, afterwards if you are interested. But I'm going to focus uh, instead on perpetrators and victims. And I'll start with perpetrators. Any integrated history has to deal with the perpetrators and has to deal with sources created by the perpetrators. You cannot understand the development of the camp system, its changing face, its changing function, and this was an incredibly dynamic system without perpetrator documents and perpetrator testimony. But there are major problems here. For a start, few of the top Camp SS officials testified after the war. The mastermind of the camp system, SS leader Heinrich Himmler, killed himself before he could be interrogated. Himmler's first inspector of concentration camps, Theodor Eike, um, the man who shaped the pre-war camp system, first as camp commandant of Dachau and then as the first inspector of this camp system, Eike, dies on the Eastern Front in 1943. And the man who succeeded Eike, um, Richard Glücks, the man who was in charge of managing the camp system during the Second World War, also dies uh, uh, in spring 1945. The most senior camp official to testify in the post-war period was Oswald Pohl, whose SS um, business and administration main office supervised the concentration camp system from 1942 onwards. But Paul was a highly unreliable witness at Nuremberg. Hoping to save his life, he lied about the camps and he lied about his own actions all the way up to his execution. Just before he was hanged in 1951, Paul still insisted that he had only been a professional soldier doing his duty. The same yarn was spun by many other uh, SS men lower down the uh, rank. Many of those who were put on trial claimed that they had done nothing wrong. Otto Moll, the former head of the Birkenau crematoria and leader of a mobile killing squad, in early 1945, insisted that he was innocent too. I was a German soldier, not a murderer, he said. Other defendants denied even the most basic truths. Just think of Arthur Lieberhenschel, the one-time commandant of Auschwitz, successor of Hess, who later claimed ignorance of any gassings in the camp. 
This is not to say that perpetrator testimony is useless. Read against the grain, even the most dishonest statements can provide useful detail. Also, a few perpetrators spoke more openly, sometimes despite themselves. The so-called memoirs of the first Auschwitz commandant Rudolf Hess, for instance, written in Polish captivity before his execution, offer invaluable insights. Take this excerpt I have here on the right. <clears throat> here Hess writes about Gruppenführer Odilo Globocznik. And what becomes clear from this passage is the genocidal competition that existed between these two men during the Holocaust, Hess in Auschwitz and Globocznik with his extermination sites, Sobibor, Belshek, and Treblinka, as Hess puts it here. Hess complains that Globocznik could never get enough, and I quote, he was absolutely determined to be in the lead with his exterminations and his goods gained thereby. That's the sentence at the bottom there. Some more junior SS men also gave telling accounts immediately after the war. Among them was a lengthy report written by SS Rottenführer Perry Broad, a former member of the political office in Auschwitz. Though Broad was very careful to not implicate himself to the extent that he is actually invisible in this account. He writes himself completely out of this account. Um, he does report about SS crimes and uh, motives and actions with often remarkable frankness. For example, when describing SS men standing amidst the bodies of Jews at the Birkenau gas chambers, Broad notes that they, and I quote, simply did not see a Jew as a human being. Such documents written by the perpetrators can help us better understand SS behavior. And it also complicates the popular view of perpetrators. In the immediate post-war years, SS men from the camps were often described or seen um, in a very cartoony way as monsters, as beasts. Um, it was a very undifferentiated way of looking for good reason. But clearly things were more complicated. And more recent studies of perpetrators have been far less concerned with mental uh, issues or illness, but with ideology and with situational factors. Since Christopher Browning's pioneering study of Police Battalion 101, Ordinary Men, historians of the Holocaust have drawn on the insights of social psychology to explain how <clears throat> often ordinary men and women became mass murderers. They point to group pressure, they point to alcohol, they point to careerism and many other more situational factors. Important as these works are, however, they cannot fully uncover perpetrator motivation as the exact balance between ideological and situational factors is almost impossible to determine. Let's take the example of Hess himself. Clearly, situational factors shaped Hess's behavior. He often acted with extreme force because the SS code branded compassion as unmanly. I wanted to become notorious for being hard, he wrote after the war, so that I would not be considered soft. But Hess also tormented prisoners because he hated them. His mem memoirs reveal a man full of fear and loathing, fear of Jews, of Russians, of so-called gypsies, criminals, homosexuals, and others. He was, in his own words, a fanatical national socialist. So how do we balance these ideological obsessions with the more situational factors? That is one of the big questions. To reconstruct perpetrator actions, historians also need to examine SS records. In popular memory, the camps are synonymous, perhaps above all, with 
limitless SS violence. There are two main reasons for that. One is that extraordinary acts of violence were etched into the minds of survivors. And secondly, they were also often the focus of post-war judicial investigations. And that was right, but by foregrounding extreme acts of violence, um, this tends to obscure the more everyday operation of terror, the, in inverted commas, ordinary acts of violence. And each camp had a very elaborate, worked out bureaucracy of repression. There were departments, offices, sub-offices, staffed by managers, by clerks, secretaries, telephone operators, mechanics, drivers. These were, this was a huge infrastructure of terror. There were regulations, directives, schedules, rosters. So while SS actions might appear unrestrained at first sight, there was some order behind this terror. Every day reports were drafted, transport lists written, forms filled in, telexes sent, statistics calculated. Just one example. One day in the Auschwitz satellite camp Neudax, a starving Greek prisoner called Chaim Kalvo made a deal with a kapo. In return for a golden crown, which the kapo immediately wrenched from his jaw, Kalvo received some bread. But the SS got wind of the deal. And on November 26, 1943, Calvo was interrogated in the political department, Abteilung 2, with a local SS man keeping a written record signed by Calvo, which is what you see here. Now, this interrogation formed the basis for an official SS application for punishment, where the SS used a standard pre-printed form which proposed that Calvo should receive 10 lashes. This form was signed by the local SS doctor who uh, agreed, testified, that there were no medical objections to Calvo being punished. The form is then dispatched to Camp SS headquarters in faraway Berlin Oranienburg. There, SS officials uh, review the case, approve the form, and send it back to Auschwitz. And now the path is clear for punishment. The local SS designates witnesses and an official executioner. And on February 11th, 1944, several months after the supposed transgression, Calvo is whipped. A record of this is added to his files with two duplicates filed elsewhere in the huge filing system at Auschwitz. In this way, the SS left a gigantic paper trail. Much of this trail is no longer visible to us today because before the war ended, SS officials in all of these camps, subcamps, and uh, commandos destroyed files. What remains behind is fragmentary and dispersed across archives around the world. If you want to consult original documents pertaining to Auschwitz, you will have to do research in Poland in Germany, in Russia, in Britain, Israel, the US, and other countries. But even if every SS record had been preserved, historians would not gain full knowledge. For a start, many documents are misleading. Often, this was deliberate to camouflage crimes. Asked after the war about the official record he had produced in 1942 of the Wannsee Conference, Adolf Eichmann explained that the participants had talked, and I quote Eichmann, in very blunt terms about mass murder, which was very different from, quote, the language I had used in the minutes. More generally, many important decisions and discussions about the camps were never fixed in writing in the first place. So key orders, key instructions are not written down. They are transmitted in meetings and in telephone calls. For example, when it comes to meetings between Hitler and Himmler about the camps, 
we have at best a few scribbled words in Himmler's very hard to decipher handwriting. And they often leave a lot of room for interpretation. Let me be clear, we know that Hitler had information about the camps, he gave crucial orders and made key decisions about their future. Here, for example, we have a note by Himmler from um, 1935, where in the last line, this is about a meeting with Vortrag beim Führer, so there's a lot, lot a meeting, a, a, a notes by Himmler uh, for this meeting, and the last point here is Gesetz SS Division, and we know from the context um, that Hitler agreed here for the German state to pay for armed SS troops um, at the concentration camps, which ensured that the camps would become a permanent feature of the Nazi state. Um, up to 34-35, um, it isn't clear uh, yet whether this camp system, which sprang up in an improvised way in 1933 to destroy the political opposition, whether this system is going to become a permanent feature of the Nazi state or whether this new dictatorship is going to be able to rely on authoritarian law alone. Uh, and it is key decisions by Hitler in 35 which ensure that the camps become a permanent feature of the Nazi state. Um, but, you know, these scribbled notes are, are, you know, a long way from a recording of the conversation or even minutes of this meeting. Himmler left far more fingerprints on the history of the camps than Hitler did. Now, what you can try to do is follow Christopher Browning's uh, dictum that if you want to know what Hitler is thinking, you need to look at what Himmler is doing. Um, and that can work, but obviously only up to a point. There's still some uncertainty involved here, which is why in any history of the camp system, um, Himmler is a far more prominent figure than Hitler. We know even less about, we would know even less about SS policies had it not been for prisoners in camps who took administrative positions functionary positions, as it's sometimes called, but I think that's a problematic term, um, who risk their lives by copying or hiding SS documents. In Sachsenhausen, a prisoner scribe copied confidential SS records onto pieces of wafer-thin paper and hid them in his glasses case, and these notes have survived. In Buchenwald, a medical carpal saved the SS record of the Typhus Experimental Station from destruction. That couple was Eugen Kogon, whose book on the SS state is uh, actually still in print today. And in Bauthausen, two Spanish prisoners made secret copies of SS photos, which were later hidden by the camp resistance. Similar acts of bravery occurred in many other camps, and that brings me to the role of prisoners in recording their own fate. Following Sol Friedländer, contemporaneous records made by victims are central for an integrated history of the Holocaust. Victims who wrote at the time without knowledge of what would become of themselves and what would become of the Nazi regime. They reported what they saw, what they heard, what they felt, at this moment in time, recording their immediate reaction in, as Friedlander puts it, moments of shock, of amazement, of denial. And these sources are crucial, but they are also extremely rare in the case of the concentration camps. The very nature of the camps, the relentless drill, the constant violence, the exhaustive and exhausting slave labor, the hunger, the illness, all this made writing in secret almost impossible, even if prisoners had access to pen and paper and hiding places for their writings. Still, despite these almost insurmountable obstacles, prisoners or some prisoners tried. 
some more privileged inmates kept diaries. Taking advantage of his sheltered office job in Dachau, the German political prisoner Edgar Kupfer, who we see here in his original um, camp uniform after liberation. Kupfer wrote hundreds of pages between 1942 and 1945, which you see here um, in this photograph. Other prisoners sent secret letters to their loved ones outside. The young Polish prisoner Janusz Poganowski, for example, sent several messages from Auschwitz to his family. In the last one, written on April 21st, 1943, just three months before he was hanged in Auschwitz main camp, he pleaded for food parcels because, quote, my current provision is very poor. Even Jews in the Birkenau Sonderkommando, who were forced to work at the gas chambers and the crematoria, buried notes and letters on the campground. Here, they recorded the daily duty of mass murder with a close-up lens. They recorded moments of fear, of defiance, of resistance by the doomed, which would otherwise have been lost to history. And they also recorded the desperate dilemmas of the men of the Zonderkommando themselves, who had to drag the dead from the gas chambers and burn them in the crematoria to keep living themselves. Not all of these Sonderkommando notes were found after the war, and some are only now being read for the first time. Only very recently, um, for instance, have we been able to read parts of a letter written by the Greek prisoner Marcel Najari. His letter had been discovered um, in 1980 uh, inside a flask on the grounds of Birkenau. But after 35 years of being buried underground, only 10% of that text could be deciphered. Thanks to a IT specialist in Russia, we can now read almost 90%. So you can see here on the left, the version that was available to scholars in 1980, and on the right-hand side, the computer-enhanced, um, as if with magic, version we have today. And this was literally published a few weeks ago. So this is, this is, this is hot off the academic press. And on this page here, which we hadn't been able to read before, Najari records his conviction that the SS will murder these Zonderkommando men, and I quote from the letter, because we know so much about their unbelievable methods, their abuses and actions of revenge. And Najari was proven right, um, because the SS did, um, not soon after this letter was written, murder the majority of the surviving members of the Zonderkommando. Contemporaneous sources such as these letters and diaries are invaluable, but as I've already said, they are also extremely rare. Once Nazi victims disappeared into the camps, their voice tended to disappear with them. Just think of Anne Frank, whose diary breaks off when she was discovered in hiding in Amsterdam, and we have no record in her own, vo in her own voice of her deportation uh, and suffering in Auschwitz and later Bergen-Belsen. To fill the gaps in the historical record, we have to also look at post-war survivor testimony. And it's extraordinary to see just how many survivors testified in the very first days, weeks, months, and years after liberation. Um, of course, not everybody could speak. Jorge Semprun, who survived Buchenwald as a Spanish political prisoner, later said, I had to remain silent for 15 years to survive. But there was no such thing as collective silence. On the contrary, many survivors were impatient to speak out. Throughout their unbearable suffering in the camps, they had drawn strength from the prospect of bearing witness, and they spoke as soon as they could, sometimes still inside the camps. There must be literally thousands of 
survivor accounts from 1945 and 1946 alone, given to allied war crimes prosecutors, given to NGOs, um, published in pamphlets, in books, in articles, in newspapers. Many more such testimonies have followed since, in German courts, Polish, Austrian, Israeli courts, in videos, articles, books. If you look at the USHMM oral history collection and type in Auschwitz, you will get more than 16,000 hits. Or at least I did when I tried it last. Maybe it has grown since. Inevitably, all of this material from the post-war years creates more sets of questions for historians. The most obvious is which testimonies to consult. After all, no historian alone, not even a small team of historians, will be able to go through all of this material. So what we could try to do is to collect testimonies or use testimonies which are representative of the wider prisoner population, i.e. testimony which covers a range of backgrounds in terms of nationality, ethnicity, religious belief, social class, political beliefs, age, gender, and so on. But that's easier said in one sentence standing here than it is done in practice. What are the problems then? Well, first, even such a broad approach cannot hope to cover the entire range of prisoner experience. I'll give you one example. At the end of 1944, the largest camp complex of all is no longer Auschwitz because a significant number of prisoners have already been deported out of Auschwitz in the preceding months. The, the biggest camp complex in late 44, early 45 is now Buchenwald with almost 100,000 inmates. Those inside the main camp, actually, I mean, the, the, the majority of those, are now, of those prisoners are held in satellite camps. If we look at the main camp alone, we find more than two dozen different nationalities um, when we look at the prisoner population. How do we describe their experiences in the camp? Well, in my own book, I talk about some German political prisoners and their role in the camp resistance. I talk about Jewish prisoners who suffered in the, in the so-called little camp in Buchenwald. But other prisoners are not included. What about the 1,461 Italians, the 24 Swiss prisoners, the eight Portuguese prisoners who are in Buchenwald at the turn of the year 44, 45? I didn't include them. So on the, the first problem is we cannot hope to cover the entire prisoner experience, much as we can try. The second problem is that some prisoner perspectives cannot ever be recovered because of the silence of the victims. This is true for the drowned, as Primo Levi called them, who left no accounts behind, like the estimated 900,000 Jews who were forced into the gas chamber at Auschwitz on arrival, i.e. without prior uh, registration following um, their deportation to the camp. It is also true for the so-called Muslimmenner, registered prisoners who were so sick, starved, and weak that they were barely alive and then perished or were selected to be killed by the SS. One of those selections we can see here in a contemporary drawing made of Auschwitz by a prisoner who's never been identified. And what we see here is um, starved prisoners who would have been called Muslimena by the others being led to a track which, um, uh, with the Red Cross sign, which would have gone to the gas chamber. Then there were those prisoners, so we have those prisoners whose voice dies in the camp, and we have those who survive but who had no voice or who were not heard. Few Soviet prisoners spoke out in the early decades after the war. Soviet prisoners made up one of the largest prisoner groups in the concentration camps during the war. But there are few records from the early post-war period, uh, which has something to do with the fact that they were often suspected, suspected of having been traitors when they came back. And not a few of them um, traded their place in the Nazi concentration camps after liberation with a place in the Gulag. 
As for German social outsiders, such as the homeless, beggars, and petty criminals, who formed the largest prisoner group in the last years before the outbreak of war, well, their social stigmatization continued after the war ended, and as a consequence, they only very rarely spoke out. And it's almost impossible for historians to get to their experience in a, in a substantive way of what the camps were like. So some of these gaps will remain. Others can be filled in with determination, with different methodologies, and with luck. Um, and I want to illustrate that by one example um, from my own work. I decided to start the, the book with three snapshots of Dachau. Um, so it starts with a brief paragraph on Dachau in 1945 on the Day of Liberation, and then moves backwards to Dachau in 39, and then Dachau on the very first day, on the 22nd of March, 1933. The idea being that I want to lay out at the beginning very clearly to readers that the image we have of the camps, which is very much shaped by liberation photographs, only captures one part of the camp's history, and that this was an incredibly changeable, dynamic system. It seemed sensible to me at the end of the book to return then once more to Dachau and the liberation of Dachau to kind of come full circle. And one of the most important sources we have for the liberation of Dachau for that day, the 29th of April 1945, is that diary by Edgar Kupfer, which I mentioned before. And this was written literally kind of, kind of a few hours after the event. And one scene in particular in the diary caught my eye, and here Kupfer describes the moment that Moritz Choinovsky, a Jewish prisoner who had survived Buchenwald and Auschwitz, meets him, Kupfer, in the infirmary at Dachau. He embraces him and kisses him. And Kupfer writes in his diary, is it possible, Choinovsky sobs, and he cries, and I think how he has suffered, and I cannot hold back my tears. And this seemed an appropriate way for me to end this chapter, because that phrase encapsulates the suffering of the liberated prisoners and their elation um, in, this, in this moment they had longed for for so long. But I didn't want the story to end there. I'd always planned to write an epilogue to deal with the legacy of the camps and to counter the impression you sometimes meet of people thinking of the liberation in some way as a happy end for survivors. What I wanted to do was to highlight the enduring injuries of the camps, the suffering and the memories the camps left, the desperate struggle of survivors to rebuild their lives, the indifference of wider society, and the often demeaning struggle for compensation. But rather than starting this as an abstract tale, I wanted to illustrate it by returning to the story of Moritz Choinovsky, um, who we see last in Dachau during the liberation. What happens to him after this tearful encounter with Kupfer in the infirmary at Dachau? Nobody knew. And kind of through luck, I managed to uncover it. The first lead I found was a small publication on Jews in Magdeburg, which told the story not of Chernovsky, but of his daughter and her fiancé. I contacted the author of that piece, and she put me in touch with Chernovsky's granddaughter, who lives in Hamburg. From her, I received some letters that offered first glimpses into Chernovsky's post-war life. They also revealed that he'd made a claim for compensation or restitution, which allowed me to then track down his file, which is still held to this day at the offices of the Bavarian Operation Office in Munich. And I also found some more material in the uh, uh, Red Cross Tracing Service archive in Bad Aarhusen. With all of this material, it was now possible to 
start the epilogue charting Chojnowski's life after the war, his departure from Dachau, his years of suffering and destitution in Munich or near Munich, and his eventual emigration to the United States. In poor health and poverty, he sent this letter in 1957, where he pleaded with the authorities in Bavaria to finally settle his case for reparations to save me from my hardship, um mich von meiner Not zu retten. Czernowski died in Toledo in 1967. But even when we are fortunate to be able to reconstruct as historians a prisoner's life in this way or path, many blanks remain because survivors did not or could not discuss certain experiences or because no one asked. I was unable to speak to Chernovsky. Then there is the question of memory. Survivor testimonies are essential for historians, but they are also subject to source criticism, and this can reveal inaccuracies and contradictions. In the case of the concentration camps, individual memories sometimes become superimposed with collective memories. As the Auschwitz, Auschwitz doctor Josef Mengele gained in notoriety after the war, he appeared in more and more recollections by prisoners who had never encountered him. Christopher Browning has written about survivors of the Starachowice slave labor camp, who, testifying decades later about the de deportation to Auschwitz, recalled Mengele being at the ramp during their selection, even though their transport had, in fact, not undergone any selection on arrival at all. We all know that witnesses often describe the same events differently. I'm always reminded of Kurosawa's film Rashomon, uh, if you're familiar with that. Still, the extreme pressures of the camps and the inability of fixing their experiences on paper in the camps magnifies these discrepancies and makes some survivor testimonies impossible to reconcile. Take the following case of a young woman who was executed in Majdanek in summer 1943. When survivors testified about this some three decades later in a courtroom in Dusseldorf doing what was then the longest trial in German legal history, they could barely agree on anything. They gave contradictory accounts of the guard's actions, of the prisoner's clothes, and of her nationality. And most strikingly, they gave contradictory accounts of how she had died. Some testified that the woman had shouted from the gallows in Polish, Poland is not yet lost. Another recalled that the woman had shouted in Hebrew, take revenge, death to the Germans and the SS. And yet another remembered that her last words were full of individual personal anguish. I want to live, don't forget me. Clearly, the witnesses' own beliefs, as well as the passage of time, had shaped their memories of what had happened that day in 1943 in Majdanek. But even when testimonies fully align, can the meaning of the events they describe remain elusive? Let me illustrate this with a case from Dachau. Like in other camps, inmates in Dachau, as they set off for roll call in the morning, uh, were forced by the SS to remain silent. There was no talking. But one day, um, in Dachau during the war, a prisoner called Paul Husarek carried on talking. He was engrossed in a conversation with the prisoner next to him. And this prompted the camp elder, a political prisoner called Karl Kapp, to hit Husarek hard on the neck. We see Kapp here on the right. Um, this is taken from, this is an SS propaganda photo, um, which appeared in an illustrated SS magazine in 1936 about Dachau um, and the camps. Um, so Kapp hits Husarek hard 
on the neck. And some prisoners saw this as typical behavior for this carpal, for the Kemp elder Kapp, who was known for his violence. And after the war, they testified to that in a courtroom in Munich, accusing Kapp of being a murderer and a sadist. But others had understood Kapp's actions in a different way. They had thought that Kapp was keeping the SS at bay with his shouting and his violence. Even some of Kapp's victims defended him. Among them was Paul Husserek, the man who had been hit, who said in his deposition, and I quote, I am still grateful to Kapp for this punch, certain that it had saved him from a far worse fate at the hands of the SS. In the case of Kapp and many other Kappos, there can be no absolute moral certainty. As Primo Levi wrote in his essay on the Grey Zone, reflecting on prisoners who had collaborated with the SS, they may have committed serious offenses, quote, but I know of no human tribunal to which one could delegate the judgment. Certainly not to historian. I'm coming to the end of the lecture. What I've tried to do is highlight some of the challenges which historians face when they write about the camps. I want to end with one last issue, um, which I've only got time to very briefly talk about, and that is how we write about this terror, about the camps, about Nazi violence. A lot of it has been said about this from a theoretical perspective, but less so about the writing process itself. What tone is the right one? What language can we use when we describe extreme suffering? How often can we use words like unbearable and heartbreaking, which I used tonight, before they lose their power? How can we put hunger and pain into words? The first to struggle with the limits of language were, of course, the prisoners themselves inside the camps. Here is an entry from the diary of the Sachsenhausen prisoner Odd Jansen, a Norwegian prisoner. These diaries, actually, I should mention this, have just been re-edited and republished last year, and I would very much uh, recommend them to you. Nansen kind of uh, wrote an extensive diary of his time in Sachsenhausen, uh, survived the war, um, and had hidden uh, the pages inside a breadboard. And in one entry written uh, in February, on February 12th, 1945, he writes when he kind of, this is before he again tries to capture the, the extreme suffering in the camps at this time as huge transports of supposedly of, of, of evacuated prisoners or prisoners from evacuated camps in the East, including Auschwitz, arrive and um, cause a humanitarian catastrophe to become even worse in Sachsenhausen. At this time, Nansen writes, the language is exhausted. I have exhausted it myself. There are no words left to describe the horrors I have seen with my own eyes. The language is exhausted. And this anguish was echoed by survivors after the war. One cannot speak about everything. One cannot make everything imaginable, understandable. It's just not possible. Jorge Semprun said in conversation with Elie Wiesel, to which Wiesel replied, silence is forbidden. Speaking is impossible. So how do we speak about the camps? I think we have to try to appeal not only to the mind, but also to the senses, trying to convey sights, smells, sounds that made up the landscape of the camps. At the same time, I think one has to be careful not to force emotions onto readers, not to manipulate readers to respond in a particular way. In the end, readers should be left to try to imagine the camps themselves, and to help them do so, we do need to rely on the voices of those who had been there, who had themselves experienced the camps. 
To quote Sol Friedlander one last time, it is vital to let the victims speak for themselves, take over the narration, disrupt here and there the reader's foreshadowing of the course of events. Thank you very much for your time. She said it was good. <laughs> That's your interpretation. No, it really was a tour de force. I know you agree with me. Just absolutely terrific in the, in the magnitude and the thoughtfulness. And when one speaks of an integrated history and the challenge of writing it, not only the sources, but in the way that Professor Voxman kind of inhabits the minds and the thinking and the actual actors of history is that's in and of itself an achievement. I just want to applaud you for your rigor and your detective work. It's fantastic. So while we all exhale a little bit and think about the questions, I'm sure you have many questions to pose to Professor Voxman. This is a great opportunity to do so. We have the two microphones here set up in the auditorium. Please identify yourself and keep the question brief because I can see already we have quite a few questions. Thank you. Hi, Irene Kakandis. I'm a current fellow here. I teach at Dartmouth College. Um, I was very taken with the entire talk. Thank you so much. And a lot of the evidence that you were able to share with us that now exists is uh, mind boggling. So thank you for letting us know that's out there now. And I was taken with the last, almost last statement that you made about not forcing emotion onto readers. But I was quite struck that you didn't speak about your own emotion. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the emotional side for you as the historian, and particularly when you are encountering these, um, as you said, language fails, so horrific doesn't do the job, but when you discover, for example, that you can read a document uh, or someone else can help translate it for you, um, that document you showed from the Zonda Commando, that's in Greek, so that's very t t really a powerful um, document because those Greeks were mainly Ladino speakers, so it's interesting to know that that person probably thought, if it's ever found, it has to be in Greek, not Ladino. So that has me shaking, and I'm just wondering mm. what you do with that. I mean, miraculously, actually, in this case, and I should have said this maybe, um, Najari survived, um, uh, and, um, but he, was kind of, he, he, he never knew that his own writings had survived. Um, in terms of my own emotions, um, I think it's, a, it's an important question and it's a legitimate question, um, but it's a question which I have kind of so far, kind of since the book has come out, managed to sometimes skillfully, sometimes kind of perhaps more bluntly bat it away. Because I don't want this to be about kind of, you know, my story, um, you know, and, 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 you know, I think this, this should be about what's in the book, uh, and other kind of historians uh, or kind of professionals deal with very difficult subject matters too. So it's something I, that's something I talk about in private with my loved ones, but kind of I don't think, kind of I always felt that this isn't something kind of to share. So kind of it's a good question, but I've kind of I've batted it away again, so, but thank you. Hi, my name is Dina Mogeno Fox. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. Uh, you said at the beginning that you might touch on those you call the onlookers. Mm. Could you do that, please? Could I? Could you do that? Do that now. Okay. Um, we've got 19 minutes left. Um, well, in the in, in in the book, in the book, I the the, the onlookers kind of form a, a central part of what I'm trying to describe. There are many myths about the camps after the war. One of the big myths in Germany itself is that nobody knew, right? So these, the kind of, there were these camps, but you know, nobody had any idea of what was going on, and that is a myth which is being pushed kind of 
even as the bombs are still raining on Germany. So even before the end of the war, we already have in, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, occupied parts of Germany, church leaders and other local notaries who push this line that, you know, okay, I mean, you have, there's some, there's some quotes I have in the book from church leaders in Weimar, very near Buchenwald, kind of who say, you know, kind of, oh, it's you know, terrible what happened there, but we didn't know. So this myth is, is a very powerful one. And what I try to do in the book is reinsert kind of society into the drawing on the works of many historians, um, local historians as well, that has been done in, 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 in the last few decades. And what becomes clear from this work is that the camps were incredibly visible. Um, it changes at different times. Um, obviously, a place like Auschwitz is, is less known at the time than a place like Dachau, which people already start making jokes about in 1933. Um, but especially the spread of the satellite camp system during the war, you saw that on the, I'm not sure if I can, if my technical abilities allow me to, hey. Um, Go, go back, as it were. Um, I mean, this gives you some, I mean, this, and this, these aren't all these satellite camps. Um, uh, you, you come to a point where there are not just one or two, but kind of a dozen sub-camp satellite camps in big cities in 1944. And people see prisoners being marched to work, uh, working there, being abused. Um, sometimes they see trucks with death prisoners being, being carted away. This isn't secret. So that's kind of, you know, that, that, that is part of the story. But of course, there are then problems again with sources here, but kind of, I need to stop myself. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Mark. I'm one of the 80,000 lawyers in the District of Columbia. <laughs> um, just a, a question on the evolution of the camp system. Uh -huh. who, who came up with it originally? Did they look back at some other example that they emulated, or was this unique to Germany? And just the evolution, I assume the camps didn't start out to be the, uh, the death machines that they became. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the, I mean, that's, that's two questions, really. Maybe I'll start with, the, with the, the, the second one. There isn't a Nazi blueprint for concentration camps when, they, when the Nazis come to power. Kind of the Nazis have to invent the Nazi concentration camp, as it were, and there's a lot of um, trying out uh, a lot of improvisation in the early years. And then you have gradually this system evolving. But even once you have the camp system as we know it now in our minds by the late 1930s with the uniforms and the insignia um, and the barracks, um, the typical, if you will, Nazi camp, though there isn't a typical Nazi camp, um, by that stage, in the, in, the, in the immediate period before the outbreak of, Second World, of the Second World War, prisoners are still significantly more likely to be released than to die inside. Um, so in the, the, the living conditions inside the concentration camps changed dramatically during the war. So systematic starvation, systematic execution, mass murder, gas chambers, this is something that emerges during the Second World War. In terms of where the Nazis look, um, there are some claims that the Nazis had looked to German colonial camps. There were claims that the Nazis had looked to what's happening in the Soviet Union. Um, but I have to say, I haven't seen any persuasive proof of, of either of those theories. Um, to me, the system is, is very much homegrown, and that accounts for this period of extraordinary uh, uh, improvised terror early in 1933 and 34. I mean, what happens is that uh, these camps are set up, as I say, to destroy the political opposition, um, but there is no blueprint. So what Nazi forces, paramilitaries, SA, SS, police, and so on do is grab any space they can find. So you've got impromptu camps and torture cellars set up in on sports grounds, in disused hotels, um, in pubs, in bars. Uh, in Berlin alone in 1933, there are over 170 of those sites of early terror. And that literally means if you live in a working class district, 
of Berlin that there is going to be a camp, if not on every corner, then every other corner, where people are beaten and you hear them on the streets, which is, of course, part of the function of these camps. Um, but anyway, kind of, I mean, this, 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 this is something ultimately, I think, you know, German-grown, made in Germany. I think we're here. Hi, uh, my name is Jordan. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. A uh, two-part question. The first one is, I, I know in your book, at the uh, back of the book, it lists the... Um, the concentration camps, the main concentration camps, and the number of people who, an estimated number of people who died in those camps. My question is, some of the camps uh, during the war were actually, there were concentration camps and then death camps, such as uh, Majdanek during the Erntefest, or um, the end of the war, uh, Ravensbrück. Um, so I'm just curious as to how you actually classified those camps with a kind of hybrid. And the second question, you, you touched on this in your talk. Um, I read this in Sarah Helm's book on Ravensbrück that um, when prisoners were whipped, Himmler had to sign off on it, had to go up to him. Was this the rule in all of these camps or, or it was only um, designated for particular camps? Mm -hmm. um. There are kind of, like I said at the talk briefly, that, I mean, Germany is a land of camps, so there are, and we still don't know kind of, I think to this day, exactly how many or what different types uh, all of them uh, were. In terms of the concentration camps, um, there is a, uh, an inspection of concentration camps, and Himmler actually says, I decide what is a concentration camp and what isn't. So this is, these are sites which come under this particular authority. That is not to say that you don't have ghettos, for example, where conditions are comparable to that in some camps. The big difference I think we need to make, or what we need to make clear, is that there is a distinction above all between these SS concentration camps and pure death camps, if you will. So there is a distinction between a concentration camp like Ravensbrück or Sachsenhausen um, or Buchenwald or Dachau and Treblinka. A death camp like Treblinka, which uh, emerges or is set up um, in, 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 in during the Holocaust, uh, these camps have only one single function, and that function is to kill as many Jews as quickly as possible. Concentration camps always have multiple functions, and those functions change over time. They could be forced labor, they could be de deterrence, they could be um, destroying the political opposition, medical experiments, what have you. Um, the one exception to this is Auschwitz. Auschwitz is unique in the concentration camp world and that it operates both as a concentration camp and you have these kind of huge sites of slave labor, kind of Buna and elsewhere, um, and it functions as a death camp of the Holocaust. And that's why you have these selections on arrival in Auschwitz which you don't have in the same way uh, elsewhere. Um, the second question was kind of Himmler and kind of and punishment uh, and, and, and lashings. That has something to do with Himmler's perverted idea of being decent. I mean, there's nothing more important to Himmler than being seen as decent. I mean, that's that famous quote in the speech he gives in, in Posen in October 1943, where he talks about seeing kind of bodies of dead people, but having remained decent. Um, and that is part of also his, his thinking then, you know, where he, 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 he demands that he signs off on uh, any punishment orders which come in for women to be whipped. Because that, you know, that's something which really kind of Himmler, uh, 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 you know, should, should, should himself decide what is right and what is wrong and what is decent and isn't. In the case of Calvo, which I described, obviously that doesn't go to, to Himmler. And later on in the war, it also doesn't go to Himmler anymore. But early on it does. And he takes a, um, a perverse interest in these matters. I mean, there's a kind of, you know, there's, there's, there's reams of documents of Himmler inquiring about punishment and whipping. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to th fill in the blanks. Thank, Thank you. you. My name is Donna Wadowski. I'm actually the daughter-in-law of Auschwitz survivors. Uh, my question to you is this, sir. My father served in World War II in a mass unit in the European theater mm -hmm. at the time. 
And what was quite interesting, they entered a concentration camp to try to save the lives of the vic victims. Excuse me. It was Camp Ebensee in Austria, a subcamp. I don't know if you're familiar with that camp. My father, what he did, which I thought was quite smart at the time, he was only 18 years old. Him and another GI purchased a camera because they knew no one would believe what they were seeing. Mm -hmm. And they took pictures, and as my father um, attended to the victim, he wrote on the back of each photo what was going on. One of them says, when we arrived, they were dying at a rate of 300 a day, but with good blood plasma and nutrition, we narrowed it down to 30 a day. There's dead SS men in the pictures. So I said to my father, I said, Daddy, how did you, how were you able to talk to the victims? He said there was a American dentist that got caught up mm -hmm. in the Holocaust. So he went around, and as my father and our US troops were trying to save the victims, um, that's how he was able to get a first-hand account from the victims Excuse of what me. happened. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Can we just, um, um, can I ask you just to pose a question? Because we have about yes. well, my question nine was, minutes left and four people, and I'm thinking maybe we might collect these questions. Okay. So this. anyway, my question was, have you interviewed any military mm -hmm. folks that might have mm -hmm. been involved at the time? And those pictures, by the way, are in the U.S. Holocaust Museum. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hello, my name is Ruthie Vogel. I am a local high school student and I'm here with a class of mine. Um, I wanted to ask you, you, in your research when you were reading things written by people who were in the camps, do you feel that you got a sense of who they were as people and their personal experiences? And if so, do you think you were able to sufficiently put that in words without exhausting language mm. or using things too often? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dara. I'm an undergraduate student at George Washington University. Um, so my question is, you talked a lot about um, how difficult it is to write but I'm interested in how difficult it is to portray within museums, specifically within the museum at Auschwitz. Um, I'm currently writing a paper on the museum at um, Auschwitz-Birkenau, and I've come across how difficult it is to portray what actually happened there within the museum. So I was wondering whether you have done research into that or have compared how difficult it is to write and how difficult it is to portray within a museum. Thank you. Uh, my name's Ben Lee. I'm the Digital Humanities Fellow here at the museum. First off, thank you very much for your talk. I really uh, appreciate it very much. So my question is, um, I guess going back to the spirit of your talk here, which has to do with you as a historian, how you approach such a project. And I guess my question is, um, you know, on the one hand, as you say in your talk, uh, the, all the collections and everything are inevitably complete for, you know, an innumerable number of reasons. But um, my question for you is, how are you able to face then the large swaths of documents sort of in the, the flip side of this, which is how are you able to navigate through such large collections and then approach such a topic that's so large in scope? Mm. Thank you. Right, okay, four questions, six minutes. Um, uh, Ebenze is, is a really interesting case um, because it is the large, I mean, it's a subcamp of Mauthausen and it's, the, it's, 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 it's one of the last major satellite camps that is liberated in May 1945, so literally just kind of days before the war ends. Um, and those images are indeed um, uh, important, and you can, I mean, you can, the USHMM really is, is amazing in terms of the material that is available to researchers and also online, and a lot of those images are online. I didn't myself interview uh, um, liberating um, soldiers because I drew on a, a large number of, of, of different projects and editions um, which had done that already. So, but I certainly did use them for my work. In terms of kind of exhausting language and how I dealt with that myself, I, I did have moments, I don't wanna, I don't want to, having said I'm not going to talk about anything personal, I don't want to now go back on that. But 
I did have a number of times when I felt like I didn't have words left anymore. Um, you come to a point where you just start repeating the same horrible um, scene or use words you've already used many times. In the end, what I did do is, is, is I mean, I revised the manuscript kind of plenty and just as I went over it again and again, cut out words where I felt that they were perhaps cliche or trite uh, or repetitive. And I was hoping that by setting the scene in a very clear language and using not long but short quotes um, from those who'd been there, I could evoke some kind of sense. But that doesn't mean that I feel like I've succeeded. Um, I mean, this, 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 this is a struggle, and I'm, 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 I'm hoping in my next work to go much further down that route. Whether that's going to be possible or not, I don't know. Um, but I'm well aware of, of, of the deficiencies in that sense. Um, memorials are a really interesting question as well. And I mean, there's, there's two questions here, really. I mean, there's the question of what these memorial sites do, how they approach the, the past. And one thing you see there is that just as history doesn't stand still, memorials don't still stay still either. So um, memorial sites are constantly reviewing how they display information, how they tell the story. Um, and this is a kind of, this is an ongoing process. One of the things that interested me in the book, and there's a brief section of that in the back, is how these memorial sites themselves evolved over time. And of course, they are in many ways reflective of the political realities and the politics of memory in different countries. So if you look at, 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 um, at, at uh, Oshivenshim, um, the memorial there uh, in the early years uh, was very much focused on um, Polish political prisoners and, and their suffering. And it's worth stressing that in the first half of the uh, life of Auschwitz as a camp, Polish political prisoners were the vast majority of the prisoner population. Jewish prisoners make up a very small proportion um, of inmates in the first two or so years of the camp's existence. Um, uh, but their story and the story of the Holocaust was not really fully reflected in, in Auschwitz at the memorial. It's taken a long time for that to change. If you go over the border to, to Germany, um, in East Germany, we have sites like Buchenwald, which became a shrine to the communist resistance, writing out um, these stories of prisoners who didn't fit into that story. And um, uh, let's say working creatively with the sources to suggest that somehow Buchenwald had stood the center of some incredibly powerful resistance network run by the communists during the war. Um, if you go over the border again to West Germany, um, a number of important sites didn't even have memorials. So Dachau, if you'd, if you'd gone to Dachau in, in the mid-1950s, there was no museum there. It just didn't exist. Um, and some of, these, some of these sites have only really caught on in the last 15, 20 years. So in a sense, kind of the, the history of memorials is an important part of the legacy of the camps too. Um, finally, the question of, of how to deal with the extraordinary richness of, of documentation and, and testimony. Um, I think the, the, the most sensible way, and, I kind of, and I, that's in a way a good way of, of finishing this, um, is to say that uh, a book like I Try to Write would not be possible without thousands of historians whose work I was fortunate enough to be able to draw on. Uh, um, this is a field which has expanded very dramatically uh, in the last 20 years or so with a huge number of local studies, of studies of individual prisoner groups, camps, and so on. And this is, of course, then a guide for anybody who tries to pull these different threads together um, to, to, to use. Um, so 
you know, that, 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 that in a sense is something which is, is very important to stress. It is exactly 8.30. Um, so... I'm sure we all learned a lot and we have a lot more to talk about and if you have additional questions please join us in the hall of witness for a reception we invite you to join us thank you